Hello. Hi, and um, welcome to uh, the biological minimum. So my, my name is uh, Jean Hauser. I'm a postdoc in uh, Uri Allen's lab. And what I'd like to do with you today is to um, introduce you to the minimum that you need to know to start doing systems biology. So this class is mostly intended for uh, as an introduction to computational people, maybe people who don't have a biological background, but are interested in systems biology. And so what we're going to do now within 45 minutes is to give you the, um, the most important uh, concepts that you need to know about in order to do biology. Uh, so it's a bit of a challenge because biology is a huge, a huge field. It's, there's a lot of knowledge there that accumulated over a few centuries now. So doing this in 45 minutes is quite a challenge. So to make it, we're going to have to do one thing. We're going to have to massively simplify um, biology. And so this is not a real biology class. It's just an introduction. And if you're interested in, in systems biology and biology, we really encourage you to, to take a real biology class in, um, so that you can get deeper in your knowledge. And uh, OK, so today we're going to speak about three main topics. So we're going to talk about the tree of life which is how different living things relate together. And we're going to talk about then what is a cell, because the cell is the basic unit of what we study in biology. And finally, we're going to look at the central dogma of molecular biology, which is a universal recipe to, um, uh, to go from DNA to proteins. And we're going to talk about what is a DNA and what is a protein, too, within a half an hour now. All right, so let's get started. Um, Hi, welcome. OK, so let's talk about the tree of life. So there are many living things we know about. Some, you know, let's name a few examples of living things that we know about. So for instance, we have, um, uh, the first thing I can think about is elephants. I don't know, zebra, what else, um, bacteria, human we, humans, we are also living things, what did you say, yeah, humans, um, what else, we also have, um, I, th I think it's a good start. So um, what about how, how are all these things related? How are all these species related, right? So what, what's common between these species? And what's different? And how did they came about? So in biology, there's a beautiful theory that tells you how these different living things, types of living things came together. How, how did they came about? How did they originate? And uh, this theory is called evolution, and it has to do with the with the tree of life. And evolution is a process that takes place over very long time scales. It takes place over millions, maybe billions of years. So we have to look at it on a time axis. That's going to be time. And we're going to look at this. This is going to be billion of years. And uh, right now we're here, zero. And uh, the universe started around minus 15 billion years ago. So on this time scale now, we, need to, we can put the major events, like for instance, this is going to be minus 10, minus 5. And the, um, the crust, the Earth, formed around 4 to 5 billion years ago. Earth crust forms. And life, it is believed that it, um, it appears shortly after this. So it, life appears um, around 4 billion years ago. So 
So it's been a while, and uh, we don't really know what the first living thing looked like. Yes? When you say life, what does it mean? We're going to look at this just now. Okay. It's, it's difficult to answer the question, what is life? I mean, there's many properties you can give to life, but uh, it's very hard to come up with a, with a precise definition. It, it's a question that's still debated among biologists, so it's very hard to give a definition. The best we can do is give example and give you an iteration for, for what it is now. But there are certain properties, right? It's uh, many living things move, but uh, plants, there are living things that don't move. Uh, living things usually, usually reproduce, but there's uh, living things which don't reproduce. For instance, some, some humans, they never, they never reproduce, so, but they're still living. So <laughs> it's very hard to come up with a single um, definition. But, you know, what is life? These things are life, and, and more, right? It's uh, cats, uh, etc. Okay, so life appears, and we don't really know what, the, what this first living thing looked like. But most likely, it was like a, it was a, a small cell that lived in the, in the ocean. And this thing, this first form of life, did something very singular, very peculiar. Namely, it divided. It made a copy of itself. And now, instead of having one cell, you had two. These two cells, they inherited the property of division from, from this first cell, right? So they could also divide. And now you had four, etc. So this process started to go on and go on, go on. And I told you it, it happened in the, most likely it happened in the ocean. And after a while, you had some cells that were mostly spending their time close to the surface. And so they acquired some new properties, like they specialized in new, in new functions. For instance, the cell that lived close to the ocean, to the surface, they could um, use energy from, from photons, you know, energy from light, in order to function. They learn how to, use, how to use light energy. At the same time, maybe the cells that live close to the bottom, they didn't have access to, to light energy, because uh, deep in the water, you don't have any light that goes anymore. Instead, they learn to do other things. For instance, there are these, um, these kind of uh, the chimneys in some areas of the ocean where there is a lot of uh, seismic activity, uh, where there's a lot of tectonic activity. And they look a bit like this, like a chimney. And there's a lot of chemicals that come out there from below the, the earth crust, like from the, from the magma. And um, these cells, they learn how to use this chemical energy to function and do what they need to do without the need of light. So you can imagine if this process, if it goes on for millions or billions of years, these cells are going to look quite different than these cells. So there's going to be specialization. They're going to look different. They're going to have different abilities. And this process goes on now for a few billion years. So let's just start at the beginning again. And this is what gives rise to the tree of life. So you have the first cell, its daughter, it has babies, reproduces, cell, another one, we have four. This goes on and on and on. And at this point, you can, the cells started to look very different from one another. And it gave rise to the three main classes of living things. So all the living things you can put in three different buckets if you exclude viruses. So today we exclude viruses. Um, let's write it here. So except for viruses, you can put all three living things, all living things in three buckets. The first bucket is called bacteria. And uh, maybe you know of examples of bacteria. So um, famous bacteria that um, biologists really enjoy working with. E. coli. E. coli, very good. Escherichia, coli. So that's uh, bacteria that live in your gut. And uh, what's interesting about it is that you have a hundred to a thousand bacteria, E. coli bacteria, for every single human cell that you have in your body. So bacteria in our own body, they outnumber us by a factor of 
100 to 1,000. That's, so actually, we are more bacteria than humans in this sense, like if you, if you count in, number of, uh, in, in terms of how many cells we have in the body. And um, from a point of view of bacteria, like why does E. coli live in there? You know, it just enjoys being there because it's, it's hot, 37 degrees is good temperature to be comfortable. As we know, you know when we go to, uh, to the beach, that's, uh, you can think of the same idea. It's a good temperature. Um, and at the same time, it's perfect, right? They live, they live in the gut, so they get feeded three times a day. And there is different foods, it's tasty. So it's good to be there. So from the point of view of E. coli, we like walking incubators, right? We just carry them around, show them around, and feed them three times a day. So it's good to be here. Okay. So that's a friendly one, it actually helps us digest. It's actually helpful for us. We actually need it. Um, but there's, and there's a mutual benefit, right? So it gets food from us and we get a benefit because it helps us digest. So it's a good collaboration. But there's some uh, less friendly bacteria. For instance, there's a bacteria, it's called Yersinia pestis. And this based, it's responsible for the, the black plague, like the, the, the disease that decimated the, the most parts of Europe uh, a while ago. So that's not so friendly. There's another one, which is called uh, Vibrio cholerae. And this one is responsible for the cholera. So bacteria comes in all kinds of flavors. Some of them are friendly to us. Some of them are not so friendly to us. Some of them um, don't care. They just do their thing out in the nature, in the water, and they don't care about us. So there's, you know, there's many of them. OK. So the second bucket in which you can put all living things is called archaea. And um, so I forgot to say, what, one thing that is specific for bacteria is that they're, they live like uh, they're unicellular organisms, and they don't have a nucleus. And we're going to come back to this in the second part. But that's, that's one thing that, that makes them special. That's how you can define them. So compared to bacteria, archaea look quite similar. They're also usually like um, unicellular organisms. And uh, they, they kind of look and walk the same way as, uh, as bacteria, but they, um, what makes them special is that they lack uh, extreme environments. You often find them in extreme environments, like for instance, in the Dead Sea, where you have a lot of salt. So that's why they are called um, extremophiles. Extremo, extreme, extreme, and files because it lacks extreme stuff. So if there's a lot of salt, or if there's, it's very hot, or if there's a lot of um, strong, yeah, like just the difficult environments for anything else to live in, you usually you can, um, that's something that they can deal with. So one example for this is um, Halobacterium, which you can find in Dead Sea, for instance. And the final class of living things are eukaryotes. And this comes from Greek, so eu means true, karya is nucleus. So these are cells with a true nucleus. So these cells don't have a nucleus. These cells have a nucleus in which the DNA is packaged. And we're going to come back to this in the second part. But just for now, know that there's three classes of living things, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. Yeah? So you're asking uh, prokaryotes are also a class of living things. So what are they? Um, prokaryotes, it's a, it's a synonym. It's, it's this. Prokaryote. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure, we can, we can write bigger. Yeah. Different structure-wise, the way they produce or anything, or what? I mean, you say they live in extreme environment, or they don't live in extreme environment. But do they, are they different, like in, in what sense? In right. The environment they live, or the way they they build, or the way they produce, or what? Right. So, so you're asking what distinguishes bacteria from archaea, mm -hmm. uh, just morphologically, or this is what you're asking, right? Yes. In terms of morphology. So morphologically, they look kind of the same. You know, it's a unicellular uh, living organism. And it's, um, 
It looks kind of the same, but the, the difference is, um, I mean, there's two differences, right? So one way to look at it is, at some point there was a division in the family tree here. So this is like, a, um, it's a different branch of the family. So there's different lineage of how you got to these organisms compared to these ones, right? So they're, they're like uh, cousins, they're, they're distinguishable just by the lineage. Um, but another way to, to identify them um, is that, um, well, just like in a family, right? If you have a, if you have a certain family and uh, part of the family maybe comes from Europe and when a certain branch of the family moved to, to the Middle East, then maybe after a few hundred years, you can start seeing like different characteristics, like uh, you know maybe you have adaptation, maybe you get you deal better with the sun or something. So, it, is it the same thing here? So the, these bacteria, they have some properties. They're unicellular and they don't have a nucleus. And these guys do kind of the same, but it's just a different branch of the family. Another question: uh, Are they all like all branches or part of them can be grouped together like humans? We are we are the last of cells together, right? Right. Right. So, so you're asking like the um, for humans is like a big assembly of, of cells that mm -hmm. always stay together, and let, let's talk about this now, right? So it's a good question. So these bacteria they can survive on their own. They don't have to, to come up and make big big assemblies, but they can and they often do it. It's called the uh, biofilms, and it's actually a very important aspect of their life. So they can make colonies and help each other, but they can also survive on their own. And it's something our cells are, have a hard time doing. Yes, very good. What, what about like fungus? Okay, so you're asking humans and plants are eukaryotes. What about fungus? Let's get to this right now. That's, the, that's what I wanted to talk about now. So this process, it kept on going, right? And so at this stage, we're mostly dealing still with uh, um, single cellular organisms. But at some point, I want to say also that eukaryotes, like the eukaryotic cell, appears around 2 billion years ago. So it's, it's like a more recent than the first form of life. Like the first cell probably was an eukaryote. So this is here, eukaryotic cell. Um, so, so this process you know, of, of specialization and, and evolution keeps going on for a while. And at some point, some cells find it very useful to stick together. Because maybe some cells can specialize in, um, in taking the food that's in the environment and turning, breaking it down to make it easier for other cells to use. And they do a collaboration because maybe the other cells, instead of, um, of specializing into using the food, now they will specialize in doing other things, maybe protecting the other cells, you know, making an envelope. So you can imagine maybe you have, you know, this keeps going on and then maybe um, these two cells, they decide that it's good to hang out together because maybe they're going to make something like this. Let's make a small assembly of cells. And um, these cells are going to protect what's the cells which are inside from maybe some different aggressions from the environment. And these ones maybe are going to specialize into processing food. And then they can nourish the ones that are around. So you can get a collaboration. And maybe it works best for everybody. It's, uh, it helps everyone survive. And this goes on for a while. And after a while, cells, they just lost the ability of, of surviving on their own. Right? Because they started specializing too much. Now maybe one cell is going to be specialized into be making it possible for the, for the assembly, for the, for the whole thing to move. Another one is going to be uh, responsible to, to find food. The, the third one is going to be responsible for uh, chasing uh, maybe you know, bacteria that, that come here and want, to, and want to, to profit or infect. Um, so you're going to have, I have to start specialization. And no, now the cells can survive on their own anymore. So if this goes on for a while, for a long time, then you get what's called multicellular organisms. And in biology, the multicellular organisms, we find them in eukaryotes. Okay? 
And so this gets now to the question, what's the difference between plants, fungi, and, and, and uh, humans, or actually animals? Well, they are here. So we have to make a new branch of the tree. Let's get rid of the viruses, because we don't talk about viruses today. Um, there we're going to get three branches with new carrots of multicellular things. So um, we have uh, animals, like for instance, humans. We're going to have uh, plants, like trees, flowers. And what's specific about the plants is that they can do, um, usually they have a static sty lifestyle, right? They, they don't move around. Um, what's specific for animals is usually that yeah, they can move around. And, um, and then we get uh, fungi which uh, usually they also have like a static lifestyle, like plants. But the difference is that they cannot use um, light energy to do photosynthesis, right? So this, is, this goes back to, to what you talked about. we talked about here, maybe. So the, the plants have this ability to, to use a, a molecule called, called chlorophyll to take the light and turn it into energy. So this is something that fungi usually don't do. So what's fungi? Uh, let's just uh, give three examples. So for instance, in fungi, first of all, some fungi are, are unicellular. So not, not all eukaryotic organisms are, uh, are multicellular. Some of them are also unicellular. And so one example of unicellular eukaryotic organism is um, yeast. So that's, uh, it looks a bit like this. It's unicellular. And it's actually very Im important for uh, making that's what you use to make, uh, to bake cakes, make bread, uh, brew beer. So it's a, it's a good tool. We need this guy for, to process our food. Other examples of fungi include like um, uh, molds. You know when uh, you sometimes get if you leave a fruit and then it starts being covered by unpleasant stuff. So it can be a fungi, it's a mold. The fungi is going to use the food from, from the fruit. Our last example is the mushrooms that you get in the, in the forest or uh, in the pizza. Does this answer your question? Yes, yeah, so all fungi are also eukaryotes. Yeah, exactly. So all fungi are eukaryotes. And uh, I guess that's, that's basically what I wanted to tell you about the tree of life. So um, if there is no more question, we can, we can move on and talk more about what is a cell give a identity card, build an identity card for the cell. All right, so let's talk about cells. Let's first remove this. Okay, so what's a cell? Well, a cell is basically a membrane. So it's a, it's a barrier to diffusion. So let's imagine this is going to be an animal eukaryotic, eukaryotic animal cell. And this this cell is basically, the, it has a boundary. That's, 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 a, that's a very important definition of it. It makes a compartment. And this boundary is uh, made of, of lipids. So it can be like, you know, like oil, like fat, oil. And it, it has a name. It's called the plasma membrane. And um, this membrane is made of, of lipids, what I, just like I said. So what are lipids? Lipids are, are long molecules made, made of uh, carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, oxygen atoms. And they have a structure that looks a bit like this. 
with a head and two tails. I mean, the heads are just different, you know, just different chemical chemical groups, right? And this is this is like a like a strain of stream of carbons. And what's going on is that the um, let's make a zoom here. Um, this part of the molecules is uh, has a, is charged. It, it's polar, so it's going to like water because they're all, all around here there's water, right? Cells live in, in water. So it's going to like water, and this part doesn't like water. It's uh, hydrophobic. So if you put a lot of these molecules together, what they're going to do is arrange themselves so that the polar part faces the water, which is also charged, and uh, not polar, the um, hydrophobic part that doesn't, that doesn't have so much charges will face the other hydrophobic part of other lipids. And if you put more of them, they will come up and build these kind of structures. And so on, and so on. And that basically makes the whole membrane. So it's, a, it's like a lipid bilayer. That's what the membrane is, is made of. And you can imagine, you know, it's, um, it has the texture. If you just have that, it's like if you take oil and you put it in the water. So that's basically how the consistency that it will have. It's, it's not very, very strong. Now, um, what is this good for? Well, it basically creates a barrier to diffusion. So now you have chemical reactions that will take place inside there, and they will be isolated for what happens outside. So it, it, the function is to, to separate chemical reactions that happen in the inside from the outside, and it's a barrier to diffusion, for free diffusion. Okay, so um, this, this is it for you, uh, for, um, so plasma membrane, it's made of lipids. So that's for a eukaryotic cell, animal cell. So in case of animals, you know, this is typically uh, going to be um, 10 micrometers in size. And then compared to this, like your typical like E. coli, for instance, it's only, it would be have maybe this size. It's only going to be one micrometer in size. But let's look, look at it bigger. So um, E. coli has a shape like this. But not all bacteria look like this. They come in all, all types of, of shapes, right? So, but this is the typical shape you get for, for E. coli. So let's say um, bacteria. And E. coli also has a plasma membrane. Plasma membrane, which separates the inside from the outside. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, first of all, um, many bacteria cell, they also have uh, something around them, which is called a cell wall. which animal cells usually don't have. It goes all around. So that's the cell wall. And what it does, it, it, it's, uh, it's another help to, to make the, the membrane stronger, so it, it gives more structure to the, to the whole organism. And it's uh, also a barrier to protect um, the inside from other aggressions, like maybe like physical aggressions, or you know, it's just another protection layer. And it's made of different molecules than the plasma membrane. It's not lipids. In bacteria, it's called peptidoglycans. Plant cells also have it a lot. It's um, made of cellulose. Or in uh, fungi, it's made of yet another type of molecule. It's called uh, chitin. And uh, usually, animal cells don't have it. You have a question? Yeah. Um, but then, does the same have to go in and out? Right. So, the, yeah, so, so you're asking if. Uh, if you create a barrier to diffusion, nothing can go in, nothing can go out. So we have a problem. So how is this, does the cell deal with it? Well, it's not an absolute barrier to diffusion, right? So if, first of all, molecules which are small enough and they have the right chemical properties, they can actually cross through the lipid bilayer. So it's not uh, completely sealed off from the outside. But maybe like bigger molecules compared to the size of this, like molecules which are too big, they will have a hard time crossing the barrier. 
and then the cell comes up with other strategies like they can, um, which we will talk about it in five minutes. So if I don't answer your question in five minutes, remind me of it. Um, okay, so we say cell walls, bacteria, many of them have a cell wall, not all of them, but so usually animal cells don't have a cell wall. Another big difference is that um, in both of these cells, you have, uh, you have DNA, right? The stars of the molecules of, of biology. You have DNA in, in all these cells. And in eukaryotes, it's like, in like we talked about earlier, the DNA is not just floating around. It's actually packed into a special compartment within the cell, which is called the nucleus. Nucleus. That's the DNA. Well, in bacteria, DNA is more like uh, it's free. It's, um, it's not bound by a special compartment. Um, so, right, so I'm, I'm talking about DNA. So let's talk more about DNA now. Uh, in the eukaryotes, yeah. uh, does the, the nucleus does it stay where it, where it is or does it float around the cell? Like, yeah. uh, how is the cell? Is it a structured thing or everything is just moving in the end of the Right. So, so you're asking, does the nucleus, uh, is it freely moving around like, um, like, uh, like, a, like, a, like a bag and balls inside a bag, right? Mm -hmm. Or is it, does it have like structure? And then, so it's a good question. So the cell is actually packed with, uh, with molecules that give it structure. So it's not like the, the nucleus is bouncing like a yo-yo in, inside the cell. That, that's, that's not the way it is. There is a, there's a lot of structures and... Um, like scaffolds, and you know, it's, it's very organized. It's packed. It's, it's full of molecules there. It's not, yeah. Okay, so let's talk more about the DNA now. Um, let, let's move this a bit. S cell wall. I need to make a big of, bit of space. All right. So what's the DNA? First of all, DNA stands for disoxyribonucleic acid. That's what it means. It doesn't matter really for us. Um, what matters for us is that it's um, it's a polymer, so it's like um, a necklace. Like there's many, like a chain, made of um, single, um, of, of made of molecules that have a, a certain type. So chemically, it's made of, of what's called nucleotides. So nucleotides they come in, in four flavors. So nucleotide itself is a is a is a chemical molecule, right? So need a, this detail, the detail of the chemical structure don't matter. What matters is that. Um, the nucleotides come in four flavors. There's four types. There's adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. So the DNA is like a long string made of, of these units, which are called nucleic acids. And usually, maybe you have A, A, and it goes on. So the size of this thing is, depending on the organism, you have 10 to the 6 until 10 to the 9 nucleotides. So that's it. That's what DNA is. It's like a long st stream of nucleotides that are bound together covalently by chemical, chemical bonds. And um, in the cell, these nucleotides are not just, they don't stay on the line, right? So there's going to be electrostatic interactions and interaction with the solvent. And so what's going to happen is you're going to minimize the free energy of this thing, and uh, in the end, it, the DNA looks more like, like a, you know, it's like a big line that folds back onto itself. And this is called the chromosome. Chromosome. So what's a chromosome? It, chromosome is just, just another name for a, for a long DNA molecule. And what is, the, what is this chromosome important? Because 
the DNA and the chromosomes, they contain the construction plans for cells, right? So that's it's going to tell the cells, it's the recipe for making everything that's in the cell. Um, I mean, in, first of all, it's the recipe for making proteins, but then the proteins can make the other molecules that you need in the cell. So that's why it's so important. So now I'm talking about proteins. So let's talk more about proteins. Um, is it okay if I write here? Proteins. Okay, so why do we need proteins? Well, the thing is if you just take DNA and you put it in the cell, not much will happen because DNA is, is just, it's basically like an information carrier. It tells you how to build a cell. But it's, by itself, it doesn't have um, active activity. It's, um, it's more like an information carrier. So to make something happen in the cell, you're going to need the active tools of life. And, and this, these are called proteins. And proteins, they have a different chemical nature than DNA. They're not made of nucle nucleotides. Instead, they're made of amino acids. And the typical protein is, uh, let's say, you know, 100 amino acids up to 1,000. That's the regular size for proteins. And um, but um, structurally, it's the same principle as DNA, right? So amino acids are like building blocks, and you chain them together by covalent bonds, and then they stay together. So you, you get something like this, one amino acid, another one, another one, another one, another one, et cetera. And um, the whole thing then folds back together. It doesn't stay the line. You minimize the, the energy. And depending on how the electrostatic interactions of the amino acids happen, you will get a certain shape. Maybe say something like this. <coughs> and the shape is really important because like the tools, as I told you, they are the active tools of life, right? So um, it's like if you go into a workshop, like the shape of the tools determines their function. So for proteins, the same thing. Like the, the, there's a very strong relationship between the, the shape um, the, of the protein and its function. So what is the function of proteins? Well, we're just talking about structures, right? So one important function of proteins is to provide structure. So like you asked earlier, does the nucleus just stay around and, and, and bounce off? Well, it doesn't because there's, um, there's proteins which create scaffolds for the cell. So there's going to be proteins you know, running off from there, going to here, another one going like this, maybe another one going like this. So it creates a, a scaffold within the cell. And this, this is proteins. And what is it useful for? Well, it's, first of all, it, it is useful because you can give a shape to the cell. And it, you can use it like as a highways to transport molecules, maybe from here to there. So it, that's one thing that proteins do. They, they provide structure. Another thing that they do is they are helpful in sensing and in transport. So this goes back now to the question you asked earlier, right? We have, a we have a barrier to diffusion, so how can anything cross? So if you're a big molecule, you have been probably a hard time crossing the lipid bilayer membrane. But maybe you still need to cross. Maybe the cells need you. Maybe it's, it's the food, right? So um, therefore, cells invented proteins that sit in the membrane, and they act like transporter. So they they're transporters, so they maybe you know some molecule comes in, and the transporter protein will recognize this and let it pass through. That's one thing that protein can do. Another thing that they do is uh, sensing. So it's actually related to this a bit. So imagine that um, the bacteria needs to find food now in this environment. It's actually able to do so because it has. Um, it has specific proteins sitting here that can sense whether there's food in the environment. And then if there is food in the environment, the protein will, will send a message to the inside of the cell to activate an engine. And there it has bacteria, this flagella, and it's, it's, you know, it's like a long, uh, long tail. And if this signal, if, if the food binds here to this, to this um, how is this called? to this receptor, this is called a receptor. 
if the signal binds here, then this protein will send a, a signal within the cell to tell them to activate the engine and move towards the food. So that's something you can use protein to do. Um, I want to say that this is um, this whole idea of recognizing a signal in the outside and triggering a change to the protein has a name. It's a big topic in biology right now. It's called signal transduction. Signal transduction. And like for instance, lecture four of this class is about this. So, so see lecture four for an example of a signal transduction system. Okay, so a last thing that um, maybe two more examples of what proteins do. Um, proteins they can do decision making, decision making. So for instance, th maybe this is food, right? And this goes in, and now the, the bacteria, maybe it cannot process the, process the food uh, in its initial state, and it's going to need to produce more tools to actually use the food and break it down. So for this to happen, we're gonna need, pro need new proteins. And there are specialized proteins which are able to recognize that there's food going in and, and start building new proteins that the cell will need. So these proteins are called transcription factors, we're going to talk about it in the last part. But they, what they effectively do is uh, decision making. Um, and finally, a last function for proteins is catalysis. Catalysis. So some proteins are, um, are enzymes. What's an enzyme? It's, uh, it's a protein that helps uh, carrying out a specific chemical reaction. So let's get back to the example of food. Or, um, no, let's take another example. Let's imagine that there is a toxin in the environment, something that's harf, 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 harmful for the cell. So there are specialized proteins that are able to, to find, get at these toxins and break them, turning into something that is not so harmful for the cell. And this is, these are enzymes. There are other enzymes that, um, that the cell can use to catalyze chemical reactions. And for instance, maybe there's a complex food and the bacteria cannot use it as it is, but it can produce a protein, which is an enzyme, which will be able to chop, chop the food in something smaller so that it can eat, right? So this is a very part, important thing that's very important functions for proteins to catalyze chemical reactions. Okay, and so what else is there in the cell? So we've, we've seen there's lipids, DNA, proteins. Um, well, that's, that's basically, that's, these are the most important ingredients. There's other two important ingredients which we just need to, we just write them for the purpose of being exhaustive. So we have small organic molecules and we have uh, different minerals. And so all together, this makes the cell, right? Small organic molecules, minerals, proteins, and uh, where are the lipids? Here. Lipids. That's the cell. All right. OK. So I think by now you have an intuitive, good intuitive understanding of what the cell is. Um, so if there's no question about this part, I want to move on to the last part, namely the central dogma of molecular biology. All right. Hmm? Okay, let's make some room here. Right, so the question is, uh, the amino acids, do they have the same uh, chemical nature as, as DNA? And um, the answer is no, right? So the DNA is made of uh, nucleotides. So that's with one specific type of chemical molecule. While the proteins are made of amino acids, which is chemically different from nucleotides. And there's only four nucleotides, A, C, G, T, but there's 21 type of amino acids. 
the chemistry is very different. They have a different chemical uh, nature. Thanks for asking. Actually, it's going to be very important for now, for the, for the next part. Yeah? So the enzymes are the proteins that uh, carry out the decision that the transcription factor makes? Yeah, you can think of it this way. So you're saying the, the enzymes are the, act, the agents that carry out the decisions that the transcription factors make? Yeah, so if the decision that the transcription factor makes is that we, the bacteria or the cell will need to uh, uh, activate a new uh, metabolic pathway you know, to process a new kind of food, then enzymes are going to be the agents that carry out the function. Um, it can also be different, right? So maybe uh, the transcription factor has decided that the bacteria will need to move in the near future because the situation is really bad where it's standing now. So then the agent will not be an enzyme, but it will be maybe a structured protein in which uh, the flagella can, can be attached, right? So um, it can also, it doesn't have to be an enzyme. The agent can be, it can be anything, but it, a lot of time it's an enzyme. Because, uh, as we know, like eating is, uh, is very important. <laughs> All right, so let's get to the central dogma of molecular biology, which uh, this, is a, this is an amazing topic because um, it's one of the biggest findings of, of, of biology so far with the theory of evolution, which tells us how uh, organisms came to be, what's, what, you know, what's to, how are different living things related. So this doesn't talk about this. This is like the universal recipe to go from DNA to proteins. And it's very important because DNA is the information carrier and proteins is what carries out the function. So understanding this step is, is, is like the, it's a very important basic for biology. And uh, it's something that was started to be discovered in the 50s and it's been ongoing and it's still a topic of ongoing research, but the uh, main lines we can, we can outline now in, in, a, in a few minutes. So what I find amazing about it is that um, you know, this recipe to go from DNA to proteins, it, it's the same, it's basically the same from uh, the, the, big, the big features are the same from bacteria to archaea to eukaryotes to humans to, we work using the same molecular principles. So it's, it's something, it's universal. So what is this recipe? Well, it all starts with the DNA, which by now you know is made of nucleotides. So 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 nucleotides. And so nucleotides, remember, there's adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. <laughs> and um, the, f the first step on our way to making a protein is not to make a protein directly, but instead we're going to make another molecule first, which is called RNA, which stands for ribonucleic, uh, ribonucleic acid. And um, chemically, it's very related to DNA. It's, it's almost the same. There's just like a, one uh, hydroxide group missing there. And, um, but it's much shorter, usually. So this is more like. 10 to the in the order of 10 to the 3 nucleotides. And it's almost made of the same as DNA. So there's also adenine, there's also guanine, there's also cytosine, but you don't have thymine. Instead, just to make things uh, interesting, we're going to have uh, uridine. So instead of a T, you just make a U, right? But it's, you see that chemically, there's a like, one to one correspondence. So there's not a very big change in the chemical structures between these two molecules. And that's why this step is called transcription. Transcription. So transcription just means, just means you go from DNA to RNA. So how, yeah? So the question is why, why do we have why do you need a different molecule here? Why uh, thymine and one uridine? Why thymine for DNA? Why uridine for RNA? And the answer is, uh, I don't know. That's, uh, 
That's just how it is. And um, there are some theories which argue that um, life started with RNA because um, RNA as a molecule is it's more reactive than DNA. So like for instance, you can make, uh, I don't want to confuse it, but uh, you can make enzymes out of RNA, which the cell usually doesn't do, but sometimes it's something that you can do. And sometimes the cell do it, but it, it's rare. But it's very hard to make enzymes from DNA. So some people think that uh, probably life started with RNA and then DNA came afterwards because DNA is much more stable than RNA. This tends to break, break down more rapidly, so it can be like a historical accident. But uh, that's how it is, and there's not a good explanation for her. So, but the difference between them, is it like something to do with chemistry, or just is there like a reason that the, uh, like you is more stable or less stable or something like that? Or right, uh, so uh, what is the chemical, like can, can you make a, a function for, what is the difference in, f in chemical function between thiamine and uridine? And um, I mean, I, I, c I can't tell you what is the, what is the, the chemical benefit, but, you know, it's, it's just a fact. It can be a historical accident. Uh, that's how we are made. <laughs> it's a good question to ask, you know, maybe. That uh, maybe could be a really cool research question. <laughs> so on the molecular level, how do we go from DNA to RNA? Right? This is just the logic of it and, and a bit of the chemistry. But on the molecular level, you know, the picture looks a bit like this. So you have this, let's say this is DNA. And let's say, um, well, now the transcription factors come into play, right? So we said the transcription factors are proteins. And what's specific about them is that they can recognize specific nucleotides in the DNA through electrostatic interactions between the amino acids and the DNA. So maybe this transcription factor we recognize, I don't know, like A, T, T, G, C. So whenever, usually this region is longer, right? But it's like 10 or more in bacteria. So whenever you have this motif, this text and a transcription factor can come and bind here. And we'll st tend to, st to hang around there because there's favorable uh, energy configuration for it, right? There's good, the, um, there's favorable electrostatic interactions between the amino acids and the DNA. So when this happens, the, fa the transcription factor will recruit another molecule, which is a protein, and it's called the RNA polymerase. So this guy will come because he has favorable interactions stable interactions with the transcription factors, also electrostatic, not covalent, just uh, amino acids to amino acids here. It comes here, and what this guy is going to do is run along the DNA, and as it run, runs along, it will copy every, every single nucleotide into RNA. So we don't say copy, we say transcribe. So it just runs along, and every time it sees a letter, it adds a new letter to, uh, to the corresponding RNA molecule. So this is transcription. OK. So what do, what do we do from there? Well, now we have an RNA, which is uh, like a kind of a copy of DNA. So the next step is to go from here, from RNA, to the proteins. And this step goes from nucleotides to a new molecule, which is a protein. And it's the protein we saw, it's a bit longer. It's 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 2 amino acid. And uh, as we saw, there's like uh, 21 types, right, of amino acids. But there's only, there's only four nucleotides. And it's a different chemistry. So there's going to have, you're going to have to do some translation at some point between nucleotides and amino acids. So that's why this step, going from RNA to proteins, is called translation. Yeah. If uh, the RNA is a copy of the DNA, how come it's much shorter? Like DNA is usually 10 to the power of 6, and RNA is 10 to the power of 3. So right. 
So if, if RNA is a copy of DNA, why is it much shorter? So the reason is that RNA, usually transcription never duplicates the whole DNA into RNA. It only copies a part of it, and it actually copies the part that only the part that you need to make a protein. You don't need uh, all 10 to the 6 or N all 10 to the 9 nucleotides of DNA to make the protein. The information is, is, is shorter. And this goes into the, the question of what is the structure of, 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 the, um, of the genome. So we will touch about it in just in five minutes. OK, so this is a step that involves translation. And I forgot to write here that this step involves two actors, tra transcription, transcription factors and RNA polymerase. OK, so this step now, mechanically, is going to be a, a translation. So we go from RNA, let's draw it like this, as a linear molecule, which it never looks like this in the cell, but it's easier to represent. So let's imagine this is our RNA now. And um, as we saw, the RNA has a bit of a different chemistry, so it's uh, from DNA, but it's almost the same. So let's imagine the RNA has A, U, G, then A, A, G, and then U, 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 whatever, just a sequence. Mechanistically, what's going to happen is that you will have a big molecule, which now is not a protein, actually, but it's called a ribosome. Ribosome. And it looks a bit like this. It's much bigger than the RNA. And it comes in two parts, which can assemble. And what this ribosome is going to do is a bit like the RNA polymerase. It's going to bind to the RNA and run along it. And as it runs through it, it's going to translate the RNA into the protein. So how does it do it? So the key there is to note that there's only four nucleotides, but there's 21 amino acids. So there's going to have to be a combinatory, com some combinatorics going on, like to a code to go from the nucleotides to the amino acids. And uh, we, we can just reason, right? If we, if we, if the rib so what the ribosome does is it doesn't read the nucleotides one by one. It reads them several at a time. So if you just read them one by one, you have four nucleotides to 20 amino, 21 amino acids. That doesn't work, right? So if you read them two by two, now you don't have four possibilities. You have 16 possibilities of pairs. But you have 21 amino acids, so you cannot do two. It's not enough. So what it does, it does it three by three. Because how many possibilities do we have to read nucle um, nucleic acids three by three? Well, you know, you can, how many? Four to the power of three. Right. Mm -hmm. If you read them three by three, you have four to the power of three possibilities, which is 64. 64, exactly. So the first possibility is that we have A, A, A. The second one is that you're going to have A, A, C. And the third one uh, is going to be A, A, G, etc. until 64. U, U, U. OK. And now the ribosome, using another uh, helper molecule, which is called tRNA. So let's write them here. Ribosome, tRNA. So like the ribosome is the big molecule that, that carries out the work, but it, it uses tRNA, which are the molecules that, that recognizes these triplets. You just said you've heard the name. So we, to do translation, you need ribosomes, and you need tRNAs. OK, so a triplet of, nucleic, nucleic, uh, of nucleotides like this, it's called a codon. Codon. It's called a codon because it codes for something. And it codes for an amino acid. So now, every time the ribosome sees AAA, the code says, you have to put a lysine, which is uh, one type of amino acid. And then every time the ribosome C AAC, the code says you have to put asparagine, which is another amino acid. 
And then if you say AAG, the code says you shall put lies in. Again. Again. Huh. Why again? Well, we have right, we have 64 possibilities. So this leads to degeneracy of the code. Right? You, you, you're going to have several codons which give you the same amino acid. Good point. So you're <laughs> very good. So you, as you're saying here, that's good observation. So you're saying, um, why is it that AAA and AAG both give you lysine? Is it because it's easy to confuse A and G? So throughout the genetic code, there is this kind of aspect that the, the first two, uh, the first two nucleotides of the codons are m more. Um, they have more discriminatory power than the last one, and as um, and the, the reason, you know, maybe you can, you can relate it to the, to the tRNAs, like the, how stably the tRNAs can, how well they can recognize the codons. Maybe they can recognize better the first two. But it's, um, th th you know, th this is, there's a lot of truth to that. But um, it's, it, again, hard to say why it is, right? So, because um, you have to put this in the context of evolution, and I, I don't want to go there now, but it's, uh, it's a very good observation to make that a lot of time the first two amino acids are, are more, sorry, the first two letters of the codons are more important than the last one. Yeah. Um, okay, so using this code, we go, we can translate, and UUU, for instance, it gives you phenyl, alanine, and you don't have to remember, but what you have to remember is that this is, this is an, an amazing constant in life. Right, so the bacteria, humans, plants, they use the same code. And maybe it's not so surprising, it's because we all come from the same uh, ancestor, the one we saw at the beginning of the tree of life, right? This, this, uh, this first living organism. So we just inherited this code probably from this ancestor. So because this is one of the big findings of, of uh, molecular biology, and um, it has a name. This is what's called the genetic code. So the genetic code is what makes it possible to go from nucleotides to amino acid genetic code. All right, okay. So what we've seen now is, is how to make DNA for, uh, how to make a protein from a DNA. And this is just for one gene, but the picture generalizes to many genes. So let, let's see how that works. If there is no question about this. OK. So um, let's just remove this part. So let, let's finish here. So up. This is the DNA again. And we saw basically what happens for one gene. So I'm seeing a gene. What's a gene? A gene is a part of the DNA that can make a protein under the right conditions, right? It's, it's a part of the DNA that the cell can sometimes use to make a protein. So this is a gene, and you know, we saw that uh, the transcription factor can bind here, and then the, the RNA polymerase comes and, and travels through the gene to make the RNA, and then makes a protein. If there's a part of the DNA that can make proteins and it's called a gene, are there other parts what, are the, what is the rest of the genome doing? Yeah, very good question. So remind me to, to go into this in, uh, in three minutes. So we saw basically what we saw so far is what happens in this region of the DNA. Now, this is not, the DNA is much longer, right? We saw this is going to be about 10 to the 3 nucleotides, 10 to the 4 maybe, depending on the species. But this is just for one gene, but E. coli has around 4,000 regions like this. And in humans, it's more in the order of 20,000. So what's actually, what's actually happening in the cell is that there is more. There is one here. There's another one here. And he goes on. 
until you have like the same picture that happens 4,000 4, times or 20,000 times. So now let's, let's just think about, um, about, about why do we have all these genes, right? And why they're not used all the time. Well, take the bacteria again. So the, the bacteria, we said it lives in the gut. And if it lives in the, in the gut, then uh, usually it will need, uh, it, it's warm, so it doesn't need to, to deal with, uh, with, with the cold, right? So maybe it doesn't need some proteins that are useful if it's cold. Uh, another thing that happens is maybe the bacteria notices that you just had uh, milk. And so in the milk, there's a sugar for the bacteria, which is called lactose. And the uh, bacteria cannot eat it like this. It needs a specific protein, like a specific enzyme, that will take the lactose and turn it into something that the bacteria can eat. Right? So if the bacteria notices that there is lactose coming in through the, through the digestive tract, it will make a new protein to cut the lactose. But it will not have to make the protein to deal with the cold. So maybe it will use this one, but it will not use this one, because this one is good for the cold. But now maybe the next day, uh, you go, you go, you go to, the, to, the, to the water closet, and uh, you flush, and now the bacteria ends up in the cold water, in the, in the gutter, right? And the gutter is not cold anymore like, uh, like you. It's not 37 degrees. It's going to be, what, 10 degrees, 15 degrees? Now the bacteria will need the proteins that, that helps it deal with the cold. So we need, you will need to activate this gene to make this protein to deal with the cold. In the, gut, in the, um, in the gutter, like you know, in, the, in the pipes below the house, there won't be so much lactose anymore. So it's not useful that the bacteria continues to make the proteins to eat the lactose, because it will just make proteins for nothing. It's just a waste of resources. So to help it survive, it will not make this gene anymore. This transcription factor will not be here anymore. So it will kind of reprogram the, the protein that, that are being produced in the cell. Okay? And the same thing happens in us. So we have about 10 to the 12 cells in human cells in our bodies, right? And these cells, they come in all kinds of flavors. They come, like there's uh, skin cells that protect us against the outside. There's immune cells that hunt pathogens and help us to keep healthy. There's the neurons that makes us think. There's uh, muscle cells that make it possible to move. And these cells, they all have the same DNA, but they have very different shapes and very different functions. So how is this possible? It's the same trick. Different cells express different genes and that therefore different cells make different proteins. So that's how you can generate the, 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 the whole body. From the same DNA, you can get different, very different types of cells. So now let's just get back to, to your question. So you ask, if, these are, if this is what makes protein, what's in between? So in between, there is, uh, I would say, there is three things. So first of all, well, the DNA, right? So the DNA has um, protein coding regions, protein coding regions, which is what we call genes. But it also has some uh, regions that don't make proteins. So for instance, you know, we mentioned ribosomes and tRNAs that you need to make, um, uh, to do translation. These are actually not proteins, these are actually, this is RNA. So you have some regions that, that doesn't make protein, right? So non-protein coding regions. And these are also genes. Now, we have some more stuff. Uh, another thing we have is we said that transcription factors need to bind right next to the protein coding gene to start producing, to, to decide when to make the protein and when not to make it. So this is a region that's very important for the gene. It's called the regulatory region. So that's another part of the DNA. Regulatory regions. And then there's two more things. Um, some part of the DNA, you know, they just, um, it's a bit like uh, if you have a hard drive, right? And some part of it you don't use. So it's just there, but you don't really use it yet. So there are some parts of the DNA that probably they don't, they don't have a very specific function. Maybe that's just there for the structure. 
or maybe they're like a historical accident because um, you know when the cell reproduces, they have to duplicate the DNA, and if they do it, it can just happen that there is an accident, and uh, the accident causes um, a new piece of DNA to be to put in, but it doesn't have a good, uh, it doesn't make a gene. It's, it just happens. It's just a mistake in the copy. Like it happens sometimes that um, in evolution, we know that it happens sometimes that um, you know. Like if you want, the cell wants to divide, it has to copy its DNA. So now you have two copies. And sometimes it happens that, oh, then the cell failed to divide. And now the cell has two copies of the same DNA. So now it has twice as much DNA. And maybe it doesn't need both. So one copy of the DNA will just start uh, getting many mutations and will start being non-functional. Maybe help the cell de develop a new function. But you will have just extra DNA that you don't need, you know, due to accidents in the evolution of DNA. So this, is, this makes another part. And the last part is uh, what we don't know yet, right? So, so let's, let's put in the same one, non-functional or just uh, unknown. And uh, that's what I wanted to tell you about the central dogma. OK. So with this, I think we, we can wrap up now. So we've seen three things during this lecture, that um, biology studies living things. And living things came about by a process, by the process of evolution, which gave rise to all living things we know about. It ran over five, five um, four billion years. And it's everything that all living things can be put into three buckets, there's bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And second, we've seen that the cell is the basic unit of life, and it's made of a um, plasma membrane that's made of lipids that separates the outside from the inside. And in the cell, there's like five major ingredients. There's lipids, DNA, there's um, proteins, there's small organic molecules, and there's minerals. And finally, we looked at the central dogma of molecular biology, which is the universal recipe that the cell used to go from DNA, the information carriers, to proteins, the active tools of life. And that's all you need. Now have fun with the systems biology class, and uh, see you. <laughs>